Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Good Grief webinar, a roadmap for grieving the end of a relationship. I'm Liesl Dawson, and I'm really delighted to be joined by Antonio Pasquale Leone, a professor at the University of Windsor in Canada, who researches psychotherapy and has expertise in emotion-focused therapy and emotional processing. He's co-authored the book, Emotion-Focused Therapy for Complex Trauma, and he runs the Emotion Change Lab. And his fantastic TED Talk, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely have a look, um, has been viewed by over 5 million people, and it's also about grieving the end of a relationship. As Ashley and I think mentioned this morning, you know, this is, we're, we're focusing today a bit more on grief from lovesickness, from heartbreak, from the ends of different kinds of relationships. It's actually a topic that's uh, close to my heart. Uh, I, my PhD was on lovesickness, but in the Renaissance, Shakespeare and contemporaries and Renaissance medicine, but I've promised Antonio, that I am not going to ask him any Shakespeare or Renaissance questions today. So I will um, will stick to current ideas. Just to Although remind you. it's possible, you, that, yes, it's so possible that love sickness hasn't changed so much, actually. No, <laughs> I, think, I think there are definitely yeah. interesting continuities, but yeah, maybe not for this space, um, but some very different cures, let's say. So, so welcome. Really lovely to have you here on the Good Grief channel. How are you doing? You're all right. Pleasure. It's a real pleasure. Um, so I want to dive straight into our conversation. And I want to start really by asking you about the difference between grief from the end of a relationship versus grief from bereavement and whether these two things are fundamentally different or whether you think there are important points of connection. I mean, I, I think there are important points of connection. Option B, um, you, you know, uh, the, the biggest difference, of course, is um, in death. You know, what, what comes to mind immediately is the, the quality of the relationship, the standing of the relationship when it ends. We're talking about endings and you're saying, is there similarity? And of course there is, but um, usually you don't end a relationship if things are great and you know uh, i can really only think of two examples uh, off the top of my head one is is going to be death you have a very good relationship with somebody per perhaps and and you lose them and and so on good terms you lose the relationship the other you know but these are strange scenarios the other one that happens is actually in psychotherapy if you've ever seen a therapist um you know, when the person's doing really, really well, then the purpose of the therapy is over. And so strangely, when you're on really good terms, you end the relationship, you know? So the differences become a matter of if it's a romantic breakup or, or a falling out of friends or significant others. I think that's what we're talking about, losing significant others. And if you lose them when you're on good terms or lose them, because there's been a difficulty, that's where it's going to be different. You okay. know? Of course, people can pass away, which is sad, and you could have mixed feelings about that. Uh, not about them passing away, but about that person in general. So this is where some of the complexity might emerge. And that's where some of the things we're discussing <clears throat> today, perhaps about mm -hmm. unfinished business and things like this, might actually apply to both kinds of, you know, grieving forms of grieving um <laughs> a breakup can profoundly impact us it can really trigger deep insecurities about our life about who we are and i just wonder if you could talk a little bit about the ways that the end of a relationship can impact our sense of self yeah but part of that is going to be the, the ways relationships in general impact our sense of self, right? Um, so then you might lose um, the person that's helping you define who you are, right? I mean, and that's dynamic. It's <clears throat> suddenly one. So first, I mean, I guess I'm saying we, we define ourselves in part by how we interact with others. It's certainly not the only way you have your you're, you have an experience of being you, right? But people, 
uh, mirror you, validate you, or, or they don't, right? And, um, you know, we're talking about significant others. Yeah? Um, they reflect their experiences. And when they validate you, well, that that's good, right? Uh, and obviously, we also, it's, it's funny. I mean, we have a strong sense of ourselves, and yet we internalize other people in the sense that, you know, uh, you can think of growing up. We can, I, I could give you examples of parents, but it's also true for spouses or, or even uh, and mentors, even coworkers who you have long long term relationships with. But you know, uh, if um, if uh, a little boy falls off a, a bicycle, cuts his knee, and the mom says it's going to be okay, you're all right. You're going to get through this, right? I mean people internalize that function. And then many, many years later, somebody is giving a talk online and he wants it to go really well. And, um, and he's a little nervous and he says, it's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. Lisa will take care of you. <laughs> right. So yeah. I, I, you know, you internalize that function. And in some sense, this is really what's happening when people say, well, what would my father say? Or what would, right. And, and you recall these people and you, it brings a feeling. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 the experience of living with others and being with others shapes who we are. I'm giving examples of the, the positive ways. Of course, if you have bad relationships, it, it could be invalidated, right? Um, and I guess, and I guess there's a way in which within those relationships that initially, perhaps if you use your example of the child mm-hmm. falling and getting hurt, Within maybe, uh, you know, whether it's parent and child or uh, a kind of romantic relationships, you might Mm -hmm. get used to that person providing that form of care or doing that thing for you. And actually, when you lose them, your initial experience is losing, in a a sense, that experience. And also, I think we tend to think of ourselves in relationships in a more us way, you know, that yeah. That we have a, a you know what what some people say intersubjective sense of self you know that we yeah. it's not just me it's me with my husband it's an us and actually Absolutely. so even so even <clears throat> you know when you walk around you have that sense that somehow you're no longer the same person because that person's not with you when you've lost aspects of yourself or or things they do for you absolutely i mean you know when you say the us it's like um I do therapy with individuals, also with couples. You know, the degree to which couples talk about we, the we-ness, is a very strong predictor of the success of that relationship, right? So there's a sense of, of me and myself. We're talking about a sense of self. But then there's, you know, a higher order functioning, which is us as a system working together as, as collaborators, right? And and, that, and I agree very much with you. When you lose somebody, um, I mean... I'm sure some people have had this experience, right? You might experience yourself in your relationship as um, I'm just picking something, but very affectionate, uh, maybe a bit needy in some ways. And I'm the one who always is kind of looking for closeness. But that's, and I experienced myself that way, but that's actually a relativity thing. You know, if you lose this person and you're now in another relationship, you might actually discover that there's somebody that's more, needy or wanting more closeness than you and suddenly you're the person who's needing a little bit more alone time you know so what you thought was you was actually part of your system and how you interacted with other people no that makes Um, sense i i you know i i know couples who have lost somebody and the guy says you know i don't my job was to drive us somewhere to park the car and then we walk and do whatever we're going to do. And her job's to remember where the car is. And so he was saying, I, you know, this sense of disarray. It's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm losing my car in the parking. I don't know where to, you know, so this is just the practical things even, right, in terms of working as a collaboration. So so there is kind of a discovering part of you was your collaboration and trying to shore that up in terms of functioning in life. Yeah. Is, are there different ways that our past relationships impact how we experience breakup that, or the end of a relationship, whether it's with colleagues or, you know, family members? Yeah. How does how do the past relationships that we've had sort of train us or or 
sort of school us into interpreting yeah. the current breakup? Well, people have talked about that in, in, in many different ways, different kinds of theories across. And the, the general ideas is quite simple. You know, it's you develop as a person and you have templates that are based on your initial experiences, your expectations. And of course, those can unfold over time. The, but the more significant relationships have a larger impact on your understanding of how relationships will work, how you function. There are some very basic things. Will people, can I trust people? Is the world trustworthy? Is it reliable? Will it respond to me if I'm in pain, if, I, if I'm in need? You know, and if depending on what your early experiences are, you kind of carry that set of expectations forward. Uh, it isn't to say people are set in stone from how they grew up. I, Obviously, I, I do research on therapy. I think therapy is great, uh, but I also think some of the best kind of therapy is just a, a, a loving relationship. You know, a, 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 a good marriage is kind of the, the best kind of therapy in some sense, right? These are corrective emotional experiences if one hasn't had what one needs, but it does color the expectations of how I'll relate to people going forward. Interesting. Yeah. Um, one thing I found really interesting about your TED talk and I, it, it is this idea that when we're going through the end of a relationship in order to process it, we do take sort of certain very specific steps in order to <clears throat> change our emotions, to change how we interpret an event. And I wonder what you would say some of the initial steps are for processing the end of a relationship or heartbreak of some kind? Mm. This, is a, this is a tricky one. I mean, I, I don't think it's so tricky, but what we're trying to do right now, explain it to people, that's tricky because, um, uh, you know, one can have lots of opinions. Um, and then there are also, there's also research, which might, which is going to be more true for everybody, right? Of course, there's always the, the person who doesn't recognize themselves in, in, in what one says or, or, or doesn't find that particular thing useful and then it just doesn't seem true to them, right? So we're, we're talking about general average people in some sense and a single average person doesn't exist. I'm speaking as, as a researcher, right? Um, well, you might think that getting over the end of a relationship is different for everybody. Uh, but that's not what the research says. It says that there's there are actually canonical patterns um, when people are working through something productively. There's a million ways you can work through something unproductively. Um, uh, but, you know, generally the first thing you're, you're saying, what's the first step? The first step is going to be something along the lines of slowing down and, and getting in touch with how you feel about all this. Right. So if somebody said, well, well, okay, where do I start? I'd say, take some time, take some time. You know, um, emotion is about densely packaged units of information. And, and, you know, the fact that one feels sad about a loss, the action tendencies for sadness are to step back, conserve resources, call out for help. But, you know, there's a certain amount of kind of uh, recovering right uh, so take the time you could keep busy but that's not gonna keep that'll keep it off off your mind but it, it's still there it's still the closet full of stuff right so i think taking the time and figuring out how do you really feel about this and as you work through that it might be more straightforward or it might become more complicated which are you know successive steps like one discovers i feel a bit bent out of shape or or yeah. damaged in some way by by did, the relationship or by the loss or by the right um, or something else yeah it did strike me in the TED when I listened to your TED talk and looked at some of your material that one of the crucial things is really about allowing yourself to feel the pain of that breakup you know and again that's very similar advice one generally hears about bereavement as well that you need yeah. to allow those emotions to happen you have to let them in and to be able to tolerate them and actually by by somehow trying to avoid them by um doing things to numb yourself 
um, which are usually the dangerous things, the unhelpful things like drinking mm. or, or mm. whatever it is to shut out the pain, that somehow starting with the pain and allowing yourself to feel that, that begins the process of then starting to understand what what's happened to you and also believing that it's happened to you that there you know that this is a real event that you're not gonna gonna change somehow and I see we'll get to questions mm -hmm. but I just see Karen said something about her own experience of of telling her story in a very flat way in a very unemotional way and being told that she has you know that she's dissociating when she tells the story and sort of what should she do about it and actually it seems to me Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, from what you say and things that Julia Samuel has said that, you know, feeling that pain and allowing yourself to experience that is an initial step, although very hard. Yes. I mean, I, I think, you know, um, what we need and it exists in, in, in the literature, I'm talking science and, but, you know, in, in the, in the general public is, uh, more sophisticated way of understanding what emotions actually are and, um, and, and, and what they're for, because of course, we have, a, we have, we feel stuff as part of our evolutionary inheritance, right? It's not an accident. And if you could turn off and feel nothing, it wouldn't be very good for you. I could give you lots of examples. There are actually some neurological pro disorders that involve that and people don't function well. You know, so emotion is adaptive in the box, right? I mean, this is this is what we're that doesn't mean it's never maladaptive. So the problem is just feel your feelings. The question quickly should that should quickly follow is. Is what I'm feeling productive or is it not productive? Right. Is it mal perhaps maladaptive? Um, and uh, and just because it's painful doesn't mean it's not productive right? Sadness is painful. Um, but if you've lost something, well, that's what loss feels like. And there's meaning there. And you have to search that. Um, if you think of the, mm, the social rituals, I'll call them related to, to grieving a funeral and so on and so forth. And right. I mean, this is part of working through the sadness. If one pretends that isn't part of one's life, then, then you get stuck right? I mean, you can't move on. You have to feel something before you can. A mentor of mine, Les Greenberg, used to always say, and still says, <laughs> you, you know, you have to arrive at a place before you can leave it. The puzzle is, there are things like rumination, or kind of brooding, or beating myself up, or blaming myself, and that never comes to an end. I mean, you will just, so these are unproductive examples. Um, for the, for the, the person who commented about, well, I tell the story in a cold sort of way is I'm told I'm dissociating. Uh, well, that, that you may or may not be dissociating. I don't know. I wasn't there. Right. Um, but dissociation is, is kind of when something is in some sense so intense that you get detached from reality. It's, yeah. Um, it's a way of shutting down in order to so, stop the pain. Yeah. I mean, there are other ways of keeping sort of your experience, your lived experience at a distance. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I know somebody who talked about the death of a friend uh, in very medical terms, a congenital heart disease because of no, no, no. And then this happened and he died in his sleep. And, you know, and it was all very technical. And of course, that was true. This guy it wasn't dissociating, but he's avoiding the, the, the deeper significance for him and for his life. So that might yeah. just be about taking a breath and giving oneself permission to feel and sad getting, about stuff and getting sad. enough support you know sometimes it's too scary to do that on your own and mm -hmm. therapy is one space where someone can sit with you and and you know slow you down and 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 give you support but yeah can I ask you 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 mentioned earlier <coughs> this thing about unfinished business and I sure. think this seems it's really important it's really interesting it's also there for bereavement as well and could you say a bit about the role of unfinished business in the end of a relationship, um, what it is and what can be done to help with this. Yeah. So <clears throat> unfinished business. Um, I think uh, we can think of a, a kind of um, 
not all losses, if we're talking about death of a loved one, <clears throat> not all of them are straightforward, right? I mean, if, if you lose a, a partner who you were very close to, obviously close to loved or lose a child or lose a, you know, that's going to be, um, I'm going to call it simple grief. Simple doesn't mean it's easy to do. It doesn't mean it isn't extremely painful and doesn't, for some people, haunt them in some ways, right? But it's simple in the sense that you have to work through the loss. <clears throat> there are other examples where somebody might have unfinished business with the person that they lost, right? Let's imagine there was a betrayal and I feel resentful and the person dies. I have mixed feelings about that, right? I, I mean, I, I wish there were things parts of the relationship that I valued and that I cared for, and now I miss terribly. Um, but there are also parts of the relationship like being betrayed that I don't miss and that I, I'm still angry about, right? So we'll call this complicated grief in, in some sort of way. And I could get more into that kind of, you know, in some sense, it's about feeling ambivalent about closure. Right. You're either just working toward closure, which can be hard enough as it is, but some people are ambivalent about it. Um, you know, in, in a straightforward grieving process, I guess it's like people experience like there was a fair exchange. It, of well, and, it's love. The, and it's those conversations that you want to finish. You know, there, there is, um, mm. you know, you, you have things that are left unsaid and whether it's saying I'm sorry, or whether it's saying I'm really angry with you about X, yeah. I think that kind of emotional content, when it has yeah. nowhere to go, I think that can really feed that sense of something unresolved and the difficulty of of, of getting over someone, um, or however you want, want to call it. Somebody on the chat again talked about being ghosted and a long-term mm -hmm. partner mm -hmm. just sort of disappearing. And I think, again, yeah, it's those hard. kinds of questions where you want to have that conversation and you can't that seems really difficult yeah that's i mean that's that's key right and i think if we we're just kind of create two um, contrasting examples you could have a relationship where there was a um i'll call it a fair exchange of of love it's it's simple right and now i've lost the person and i have to so the conversation is about saying goodbye um, and getting closure or one could have a relationship or have had a relationship where it, it to put it in simple terms it didn't seem fair like maybe somebody took something that they shouldn't have uh, that you made sacrifices you regret or or you feel angry or ashamed about how you've been treated you know so that's some those are more complicated conversations right um uh, it's not just about rebuilding a life without somebody. It's also about repairing myself so that I can then say goodbye to the relationship and maybe rebuild the life. And would you suggest sometimes with people who are bereaved, they might write a conversation, you know, write a letter to the person who's died, or they might take specific steps to sort of actually do that conversation that they so desperately need but can't have, or even, you know, in a therapeutic sense, do both sides of the conversation. I'm just thinking that the need doesn't go away. And sometimes Absolutely. just giving someone space to say the things they want to say, even if it's the wrong person hearing, um, can be, can, can be kind of, I don't know, it can feel good. It can sort of get that off your chest in some way. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, do I think it would be useful to, to imagine these sort of conversations? Yes, right? And actually a kind of a main intervention in, in emotion-focused therapy, but there, there are different ways of doing this in different approaches and, and, and folk psychology solutions, right? Um, but sometimes I actually pull out an empty chair. This is called an empty chair task. Can you imagine the person here? And what do you need to say to them, right? I mean, and actually people have these, that might seem weird and kind of, but it's actually much more natural than you would think, right? People do this. I do this. You do this. People in the chat do this. I mean, we talk. They tell you the story and they go, you know, and he would say, he would be like, you don't, and they speak as if they were their other person or, 
you know, and I wanted to say you, and they speak, they insert dialogue as if they were in dialogue. I mean, this is almost begging, to, let's do it. Let's imagine the person here and have a conversation. Yeah, writing a letter might be another example, right? Um, there are these ways of unpacking because the reality is emotion is always about needs, always. And negative emotion, when you feel badly in some sort of way, especially if it's primary, not just a kind of reactive, it's primary. If it's negative, it's about unmet needs. So what do you need? And where one place people really get stuck in grief, and especially in complex grief, also in trauma, I've written a book about trauma, is they get stuck with, I need this from that person. I need him to apologize, or I need her to acknowledge whatever, and I, right? And that might feel true when you're in the relationship, but actually it's about what you need as a person to flourish to, right? This is an existential need. It would have been nice to have that need met in that relationship, right? It's like closure. You actually don't need something about the other person. There's lots of research on closure and closure has nothing to do with the historical events of what actually happened. So getting closure isn't an event that happens. It's your relationship to those events. So interestingly, you can get closure without the other person. So now we're back to this idea of having an imaginary conversation or spelling out, right? And it's, yeah, maybe I don't need that from you and maybe I'll never get it because of who that person is or, or, or because I lost the person, but I still need it. So then the question becomes, do you know what you're feeling? Do you know what you need? And once you know what you need, you kind of, this is how emotion is. You actually orient, you start to feel different things. You start to orient toward getting those needs met. It might be meeting someone else. It might be doing it for yourself. It might be making use of the, the social network and resources you have around you already. Um, and you have your needs met in a way that you hadn't anticipated in some sense, but that's a solution that works and moves you forward. That makes sense. Um, we've, we've said a little bit about some of the barriers to processing <clears throat> what's happening to you, somehow dealing with the end of a relationship. Are there, are there others that um, we haven't mentioned? Um, I think you talk in your TED talk a bit about the blame game, you know, completely putting it on the other person. Um, but yeah. also maybe I think you talk interestingly about working out what really upsets you. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm throwing things in, but yeah. actually these might not yeah, be yeah. the things you want to talk about, but they're just the things no, no, that I, you know, yeah. I think um I mean there's no easy grief, right? Um, and yet, uh, you have a lot of feelings. People have a lot of feelings. That's why they're here. That's why we're talking about this. And, and I'm going back to just highlight this idea that, you know, emotion moves much faster than cognition. You feel faster than you think, period, right? There's lots of neuroscience on that. There's lots of clinical research on that. And the, the, the you know, it's so important actually what you feel is so important that you're organized, you're primed to pay attention to things and you're organized in a way, even before you really know what it means. And so a lot of the projects say in therapy or working through one's own feelings is about figuring out I'm doing this, right? It's not just a feeling. We, we, are, we are human beings, yes, but we're also human doings right? You do a, an emotion. It organizes you a certain way, right? I mean, when you're angry, you move forward and you're louder. And when you're sad, you withdraw and you collect. When you're ashamed, you want to pull the blanket over your head, right? I mean, these are enact. These are things we do, enactments, I was going to say, uh, uh, of meaning. And the meaning is embodied and sort of trying to spell it out helps you take it to, to, an, to another level, right? Trying to unpack it, um, you could say, oh, we're trying to make unconscious things conscious. But I think a better way of saying it is they're densely packaged units of information, so dense that you don't quite know what it means, although you are doing it. And, and you need to spell it out, right? And that's going to help move you forward. And as you do that, 
Sometimes it's going to be more straightforward, like spelling out your losses and going through a process of grief. And sometimes it's going to be grief plus the complexity, right? Which is, you know, this book on trauma that I wrote about or, or the idea of the TED talk you were you were referring yeah. to. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> sometimes we we start in a defensive mode and we think we're upset about one thing, but actually there's a deeper wound that we're not acknowledging or something else that that's that's sort of underneath it. We think, oh, I'm really angry at you for I don't know, just even in normal fights, not doing the dishes or something or not doing yeah, this. Yeah. And actually sure. the thing that we feel really hurt about is you don't care about me or yeah you don't me. <laughs> or you know so I think sometimes it's also we we're very defensive we tend to react to the surface trigger of what we're what what hurts us but often beneath that there's insecurity or vulnerability or mm. or or worries about ourselves sometimes I've been most angry at someone when they hit a truth about me that I don't like. And actually uh -huh. um, that part of that emotional working through is also thinking, okay, this is actually a thing that I do that <laughs> I need to think about. Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to also ask you about, I, I mean, sorry, I, I, I want to pick that up I'll, on that. I'll but, just yeah, pick up, I'll yeah. just, you know, because <laughs> these are things we see, you're talking about a lived relationship and I'm angry because you didn't do the dishes or right. Um, and, and it, it might be worked out more easily with a person here because we might get to the truth, right? Get to it, yeah. Um, and the puzzle becomes if the person's not actually there, it's more work. I gotta, so you do have to slow down and think about it and attend to this. Um, you know, when I do couples therapy, yeah, people fight about all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, uh, sex, money, who's going to take out the garbage and who whose turn it is to do the dishes. But I think I'm going to be reductionistic here. Most fights in a couple, they might look like they're about whose turn it is to take out the garbage or do the dishes, but they're actually about either love or about power, right? It's either you don't send me flowers or you're not the boss of me. And those are the two core fights that people yeah. get into, those are the deeper issues. You know, this is just what you've said. It's like, we're arguing about the dishes, but the issue is I feel taken for granted. Yeah. Like, and with breakups too, I, it might hit yeah. different parts of you or vulnerabilities and insecurities. Um, yeah. Can I ask you about undeclared losses? So we, you talk also about the fact that when a relationship breaks up, we lose that relationship, but we also lose a lot of other things that sort of go alongside hmm. that. Could you say a little bit about that? Well, um, I, I will briefly, right? I, because I think the issue is just that um, you feel sad. What are you sad about? What are you sad about, right? And you have to spell it out and you know, if you're talking about an exercise or what, if, if somebody wanted to do something, they feel sad, what are you sad about? I mean, and you could think about the, um, the obvious things are the, the good things you liked about the relationship. Uh, I miss um, having the barbecues or, or the, the Thursday night date nights or the whatever, right? The, the nice things that you miss, the smell of the person in the morning or whatever right um the fact that we had coffee to get you yeah, so so these are easier you know um and that's kind of you know then the, so one could actually get out a piece of paper take some time and what are you what have you lost let's make a list grieve the good things that will never happen again i just named some then it might be another piece of paper Right. And the second piece of paper are the, the bad things. There are things about the relationship that you never really liked. The way she would just leave her empty coffee mugs on the bookshelf. I hated that. Um, and so on and so forth. Right. And, and the way he nagged at me when really he was just whatever. So there are things that you're also saying goodbye to that it's good riddance. Huh? We often don't think of that, but that's also part of this package the grieving package and then you need another piece of paper a third one which would be to write down the the hopes and dreams 
these are the biggest undeclared losses, right? It never happened, so I don't miss it. Yeah, but you were pining for it. You are looking forward to it, right? So these might be the children we never had. These might be the vacations we were hoping to do, the the, the cottage we were going to work on, and, and we never did that. Or, you know, th there are things left undone. And if you lose somebody to death or, 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 or even just to a falling out, you know, there are projects left unfinished, the half written book or the whatever and, and that we were doing together. And, and, and in some sense, you also need to put up little tombstones to those, but they're, they're translucent. They're harder to, to label because it's not a thing I've actually, there's no missing space here. It was just something I was looking forward to, but that's part of your reality. And so that becomes, I'm calling those the undeclared losses and you have to declare them if you want to finish the, the grieving process. I, I really like that. And it goes back to that, yeah. the the comment of, of one of your mentors about you have to go somewhere to leave it. And I yeah. suppose with these undeclared losses, it's because they often are not acknowledged that in a sense, they hang about in a ghostly manner, you know, <clears throat> and sort of are part of that grief experience, but you have to think about it sort of consciously. Um, you write a book, your recent book is about complex trauma. Does, does that uh, play a part or can that play a part in how we we grieve the end of a relationship? What What is complex trauba? Actually, I should ask first good for, question, those, good question. for those people yeah. listening who don't who don't know what it is. So this is a book I, I wrote with with Sandra Pavey. I'll just mention her. She's the first author. Um, and I'm also now have been working for 10 years on this quite big book on emotional change and the different ways of working with emotion. But the, the, you know, the complex trauma. All right. And I, it does parallel a lot with grief and, and the things that we are talking about. So maybe I'll sketch something out. Right. Um, I'll start with trauma because it's more obvious. I think you could imagine a simple trauma. It doesn't mean it's easy. It just means it's straightforward. Right. Uh, like there's an earthquake um, or a tsunami or a car accident. And, and you were part of that and you, something happened and it's horrifying and you're traumatized. All right. So you got to get through that, right. Working through that trauma, how that happens, different lecture. Okay. But, um, then we can imagine, or maybe it's an assault. Some, you get attacked by, but by, by a stranger, right? For some reason. Um, but in complex trauma, we're not talking about getting attacked by a stranger or by an earthquake, or we're talking about maybe uh, getting beat up by your dad or your spouse or, right? So domestic abuse, family abuse, these sorts of things, date rape, right? Which is not by a stranger. You know, now the weird thing is, the, the, the safe haven, the person you would go to in need, in a time of need, is actually the dangerous person. Oh, that's complicated, right? So like adult survivors of child abuse have a lot of trouble working through that. And some, then sometimes that person, that parent dies and I have mixed feelings about it, right? Um, because that was the safe person. Uh, well, sometimes, sometimes dangerous person. So that's complicated. If we go to grief, in the sense that we're mostly talking about here, <clears throat> you know, you could think of what I've called simple grief, where you have an experience of loss and your sadness is adaptive. So I'm going to give you three scenarios. One, simple grief, right? You have a loss and your experience is adaptive and, and the puzzle, which is very painful, is to... Uh, come to terms with that to acknowledge what you've lost, right? The exercise of the grieving exercise I was talking about as an example. And you do that. And, you know, a healthy emotion has this vitality curve. You feel something, the sadness. There's an intense kind of, but, but then you're done. You finish the feeling. You have to arrive at a place before you leave it. We're talking about adaptive emotion. And really the project is to finish the feeling. That's nice. But life is complicated. And sometimes the feeling, even though it might be adaptive, is truncated. It's snipped, interrupted, right? Um, I had a friend who, who, who actually I introduced them. They were um, uh, got married and had a uh, 
uh, I always feel a little touched when I, when I think of it. Um, and they got married, they had a, a newborn baby, and then he died very quickly of cancer. Boom, like this, right? And she is devastated, right? But what does she need to do, right? I mean, she, she's, she's got a newborn baby, uh, she, she's finance situation, you know, the work, I, all this work stuff, like, so, you know, she, and she, it's not like I need to take a month and, and, and take care of the baby. And then it's like, no, that's going to take years. Right. And so really what happens to this dear friend of mine, her, you know, she puts her grief on hold, but like for years. And so it gets truncated. Why? You know, it was a healthy emotion, very painful, but it gets truncated because life is brutal. And sometimes you have to put stuff on hold, but that doesn't mean. So now we have this vitality curve that gets cut and haunts her in some ways. And, and a number of years later, it's like, I'm still working through this. Right. And there's kind of like the need to complete the feeling and picking that up. Right. In some sort of process. That's the second scenario. It's a healthy emotion, but it's been truncated. A third scenario, and I'm going to invent here. I'm going to embellish, okay, because part of this. But I think this is true for some people. Let's imagine, I'm just using the example. Let's just imagine that there's also, you know, when people die, you find out things about them sometimes. And sometimes they're not as nice as what you would hope. And so let's imagine this person now, fiction, has a loss, is grieving a husband, cleaning up the stuff and the phone and the internet stuff and, and discovers this guy has had an affair. Let's imagine that, right? Um, now she's going to have really mixed feelings, right? And there's a discovery of betrayal. And, and now we have, it's not just simple grief where I can grieve. It's not truncated grief where I have to put my grief on pause and discover that I, a couple of years later, that I still have stuff, right? Uh, and some people try to keep it on pause indefinitely, right? But your losses are your losses and recognizing your losses is important to organize and move forward with your life. That's the problem with truncated grief. But here, it's not only truncated, it's also now there's a sense of shame, there's a sense of betrayal, definitely anger. And now we have the complexity of how dare you, was it me? And the person becomes racked with self-doubt, self-blame, maybe I wasn't a whatever partner good enough. Um, and so now we have this complex, you were asking about complex trauma, is it related to complex? Well, here we have complex grief. So I've given you three scenarios, right? One is a grief that has to be grieved, but it's an adaptive emotion, but you have to actually feel it and work through it. The second scenario is that adaptive emotion actually gets truncated because, because life puts you on hold. I mean, you still have to survive. Your baby still has to make it and you got to pay the bills. So then you pick it up later and that's hard, right? You just, that person finds it hard to be in other relationships, for example. Yeah, because you never finished the grieving process or this third scenario where it's, it's complex, right? The person hmm, starts to have very mixed feelings and they, they get as a person sense of self is bent out of shape a bit, right? So yeah, now we have yeah. a, a more complicated process of recovery. That's really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, we're, we need to go on to questions, but I really want to ask one more before we do, because it's it's Good. one of these questions that obsesses me um, okay. about grief. And it's this difference between grief processing, have a drink, have a drink, <laughs> <laughs> between grief processing and rumination. And I've since I've started working in this area, <laughs> I've been really obsessed with this because Grief, rumination, and processing can look very similar from the outside, but mm -hmm. one involves this very helpful turning toward an emotion so that we can integrate it, so we can understand it. The other one, you know, involves similar intense feelings, and mm -hmm. yet somehow in this mode, we go round and round, and it, it, it sort of, it isn't processing. And, and how do we distinguish them from each other? Love and how do we help <laughs> people move from one to the other? Super important. Um, and I was just sort of chuckling at the irony of being obsessed 
with rumination. It I seems, know, I know. I've, 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 I, 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 I know. ruminate I, myself you know, in certain ways. <laughs> your question is is really well placed, and it's kind of brings us back to, you know, this idea of feeling my feelings and engaging it could actually be productive or or not productive and taking the time to figure out what is this really about is is really key right so there you know an adaptive emotion will be an intense experience i have this i was calling kind of a, a vitality curve um uh, which comes from from uh from stern as the researcher but um uh, you know rumination <clears throat> is not productive by definition, right? Rumination, we're talking about primary sadness being about, I'll start at the beginning, primary sadness is being about unmet needs. Huh? If you don't know what you're grieving, the little tombstones, it might not be productive. Same true for anger, by the way. If you, because people ruminate, angry rumination is a thing as well, right? If you don't know what you're fighting for, what are you asserting? What are you actually fighting for? If you don't know, maybe it's not productive, right? Rumination, on the other hand, is, we'll call it secondary. It's symptomatic emotion, right? And people ruminate, there's depressive rumination, wallowing in the sadness, which is romanticized to, to some extent, you know, the depressed poet sort of thing, um, which can also have an identity thing where if I wasn't the depressed poet, who would I be? And yet that rumination never ends, right? Um, people can ruin anxious rumination is a classic. This is the worry wart people who worry and angry rumination. I sort of referred to, you know, there's there's a number, a lot of research done on rumination and worry. Um, and so how do you know if you're ruminating? OK, rumination is going to be this highly verbal. Cognitive process, it moves quite quickly. But what if but what if but what if right people ruminate on scenarios right? It, it's busy making. It keeps you busy. Um, and actually what rumination does is it keeps you engaged and busy and worried about the future or worried and depressed about the past without actually focusing on the present, which is going to be more painful, right? I mean, in a weird way, yes, it's emotion. Yes, it's painful, but it insulates you because it keeps you busy. This verbal cognitive loop from dropping down to what's really going on. And the deeper feelings are going to be about the loss and what it means for who I am or the anger or, or the sense of shame and what that means for who I am and how, how do I work through that, which would have to be worked through as well, right? So you can think of rumination as a busyness sort of thing. Anxious rumination is an easy example. It's always about the future. Depressive rumination is always about the past. And yet, even though that happened in the past right now, I have a deeper feeling that's actually about unmet needs. And that's where you need to go. That's really um, interesting. Yeah. So maybe sort of something about moving to the present tense with mm -hmm. that experience of loss might help yeah. to move toward processing and away from rumination. Yeah. Um, yeah rumination is not really about yeah. using emotion as a guide right and that's what we want to do yeah um we have lots of questions and not a lot of time right. we have one yeah. about dump, dumping versus getting dumped is there a difference in the grieving process whether you are the person who ended the relationship or you're the one who got dumped um is it different in the big picture no i say it's not going to be different but i mean in the in the cosmetics of it for sure it's different you you know you, you step if you're the dumper it's harder to know what you're grieving sometimes right uh um because you have the advantage of being in control of the situation in the sense that you are making this decision so that makes it a bit easier um but you know there aren't a lot of narratives social narratives about poor you, the person who dumped someone, right? So so actually you don't have a lot of movies or stories or books to kind of hang your experiences on and being, yeah, it's like that, right? Um, but I think, I know, nobody gets into a romantic relation, relationship hoping it will end one day. That, that wasn't what you hoped for. So even if you feel the need to end a relationship, it's a loss. 
And it's, it's an undeclared loss. And weirdly, there's less support um, in terms of narratives, right? Like, how, how do I make sense of the fact, you know, in, yeah. in, in grief, yeah, I, I, I would, work with I would, a woman. I would think, too, that if you're the person doing the breakup, um, you, it's harder to get your grief witnessed, as you say, it's less recognized. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. also there's more of a sense of the guilt or responsibility or questioning that decision. I think the person who gets dumped has more of a sense of powerlessness, probably, and the sense yes, that, they can't, that they have no control over that narrative. Um, so that and, and their needs are not met it. by this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we have a question that. about seeing an ex yep. every day. My ex of 18 years has been living at the end of the garden for the t- past 10 months. We share a child together. I feel like my grieving process has been stunted by seeing him every day. Do you have any suggestions to help move forward if we cannot cut our ex out completely? Um, so, you know, this is a compl- this is the, this is an example of there's reality, right? Uh, and I think <clears throat> Um, you know, relationships can end in in three viable ways. I'm going to say one of them is you uh, you you forgive the person and you reconcile, you stay together um, in some sort of way, uh, and the others are you decide not to reconcile. There's a, a separation, right? What's not really viable is we won't forgive each other, and we will stay together. That's tricky, right? Because that that means you hate each other and you live together, right? So, uh, you know, but I understand that there might be financial or or other sorts of reasons or childcare. These are the two big reasons why couples that don't want to be together might stay together. Um, And I think there's kind of working through the status of the relationship. See, those sort of arrangements sometimes are all fine until somebody decides to meet somebody else and then yeah. it breeds. So, I mean, I, would... I think some candid conversations about how are we going to manage our, our real life situations and our shared goals, co-parenting, yeah. um, and and still give permission to each other to, to move on with our lives. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes sense. I think also, you know, if you have the situation, what you really need is boundaries. You need rules. And actually I imagine if, if the ex is showing up when you don't know they're going to show up, that's particularly stressful. Well, and if you can actually yeah. create some rules about, I'm going to see you at this time, you're not going to have contact that might just make it a little bit less stressful on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But yeah, one of the, it, one of the yeah. puzzles of, of, of keeping and sometimes another question one gets quite often is about keeping in touch yeah. with somebody who, who's obviously still alive and but you're you're separated from. And, you know, I think you have to think about to what end. I yeah. mean, the weird thing about relationships is you generally become closer and closer over time. That's how friendships works. That's how romantic relationships work. You know, and if you have been together and made love and and no understood each other and now you're going to be friends how does that friendship evolve because you'll never be as close as you once were so it has a kind of you know at the same time keeping in touch mm, every once in a while might be a way of honoring the relationship the person has contributed to, to to you your life your development and you to theirs and you might also have still shared projects like caring for children educating children um, but one has to think carefully about what's the the goal of this um, uh, friendship or arrangement or whatever it is right um, if there's financial you know living at the end of the garden I don't know if we're talking about the house at the end of the garden or the guy's in a tent and I'm in the house. Uh, like some of it becomes quite, it's hard. These things now really have to be disentangled if you're going to have separate lives because otherwise, right, it, it points toward toward a relationship that you don't want. No, that, that, makes, that makes sense. Um, so we have uh, a question about being triggered about other losses from breakups. How do we deal with previous bereavements being triggered by a relationship breakup? Processing and reflecting on a recent relationship that ended rather messily and painfully. So the, the sense is that during every time there's a breakup, this bereavement mm. sort of comes back again. The um, old do I, hurt comes yeah, back. Do I have to grieve him every time a relationship ends? It's so tiring. So 
this person died mm -hmm. 10 years ago, but oh. it, it sort of keeps resurfacing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that, right? I mean, and, and this is the sort of thing that real people are, tr are trying to wa wade through, right? I, I think, you know, the key, one of the pieces is in, in a relationship loss, you know, that, that creates some sort of reverberation or echoes of the past is to, to, to be asking oneself, all right, let's be fair. In what ways is this the same as that? This loss, in what way is it the same as that? And in what ways is it different, right? Uh, maybe the person dumped me or, or whatever, that's similar, so it's a sense of abandonment or, or whatever. You know, in what ways is it different? Well, there isn't a betrayal in that sort of way. The person isn't, you know, so like this is a different loss and trying, it will be different. It's a different relationship with a different configuration. And in what ways is it different? And, and giving that, honoring that in the, the, this, the end of this relationship as it is, right? Because it's not the same person. So in what ways is it different? Acknowledging that in some ways it's similar. In what ways is it different? And I think that helps you whoever this person is, evolve. I mean, we develop the fastest on the contact boundaries with other people. And so this is an experience. And it's sad. I'm sad to hear there's another breakup, but, but it's sort of like, how are you evolving as a person? And mm, right? Because yeah. we also need to start having different kinds of relationships. But perhaps that's also part of the issue. And I wonder too there, if there's some part of that initial grief for that bereavement that also might need space to be articulated and heard you know I mm. wonder if part of the reason I mean part of it comes back because we're all humans and we remember what's happened to us sure and, and there and, might yeah, be there something there too that hasn't been given enough space um mm -hmm. to be felt and to be shared I don't know it's it's yeah yeah in a sentence it's like <laughs> when you said that it made me think yeah these these are different gravestones so it's not like you're burying everybody in the same plot, right? It's like these deserve to be treated. And so maybe this hasn't had a proper, to go with the metaphor, a proper burial, right? Um, and I'm just saying, putting things to rest in the old relation, maybe that needs a bit more time. But th these are different things. Do you have to redo it every time? Maybe you don't. Maybe it's just enough to say, ah, there's something similar, but this, this is what I'm working. This is this what's is, different. Right? Um, we're almost out of time. We talked a little bit about the ghosting question, but it does come yeah. up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, any thoughts about this experience of being ghosted in a breakup where you lose all contact, all, you know, no sense of being able to have that yeah. conversation or complete um, these these sort of yeah these ask these questions or 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 talk to the person who's just disappeared yeah. from your life. The, the ghosting metaphor is a good one. I, I know it's you know not one we're making up, but because it you know what's happening here is is kind of like a death, right? The person disappears, uh, but there's an extra layer of mm, kind of resentment, like they could actually answer and worst, they might at some point to pop in, pop out again. Right. And and so, you know, this get, the way to manage this is to fold it in to the losses. Maybe this person, you know, it's like. What you need is what you need. Right. And it's very tempting to be like, oh, I need that person still to say goodbye or you can say goodbye to them without them having said goodbye right you can it's the closure is yours to own right it doesn't it's not a shared project actually the relationship was a shared project but closure is not a shared project which you know because the world is full of scenarios where one person has closure and the other person doesn't right um and so what do you need and what do you need to say and to do that, right? And, and I'm not, maybe you write an email and you send it and they never respond. Maybe you write it in a letter and you dig a hole in the sand and you burn it and they never read it. You need to say it. They don't need to hear it, right? Mm -hmm. it's a, this, yeah. this is for you. This is what you That's need. That's pretty good. And I think sometimes when, when someone, you know, treats us badly in the end, it can feel like it invalidates the whole relationship that's come before. But actually... Yeah. 
we can still find meaning, we can still value that relationship, we can see what's good in it, even if the other yeah. person ghosts us, blanks us, you know, it doesn't, it, we can have our own narrative, our own story yeah. about how the that ghosting, impacts our life. Yeah. The yeah. ghosting creates an, uh, uh, another thinner layer of loss, which is, you're not who I thought you were. I'm disappointed in you, right? Yeah. I thought that you would give our relationship the dignity of a goodbye, or I thought I, you, you know, so there's this other piece, but that's what I mean. You can fold that in and acknowledge that for what it is, right? We're kind of out of time. We've had some really nice things in the There's chat so much to say. Um, from David, some, some, some Reen from others who are just saying thank you to you, um, really enjoying the conversations and getting a lot out of it. I feel like I learned a huge amount and, and I loved learning about um, emotion focused therapy, which is not an area <laughs> I really worked on before. And I've found really rich. So I, I, I'm really thankful to you for kind of opening my eyes to that area. Um, thank you to our wonderful um, chat, chatty audiences for sharing so much of yourself and for asking questions. And um, and and we'll have, uh, yeah, that, that's it really. Antonio, do you want to say anything else? I, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of this. I think it's really important. Uh, so I want to thank all the organizers and to the people who are listening, uh, you know, you are already paces, paces ahead um, by just being engaged, by thinking, you know what, there are resources out there. I'm going to make use of them. I'm going to I'm going to do something. I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to try to right uh, get off the couch and and move on with my life. There is a lot of life left to live. Right. And and to to get out there okay, i think that's so, great thanks so, so much on that, yes on that final note thank you so much and we'll see you next time bye for now bye bye <laughs>